Hello, and welcome to the Dallas Express video podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Subiata Bennett. Joining me today is Mark Moses, a fiscal expert and the author of The Municipal Financial Crisis. Mark brings exceptionally sharp insights into the budgetary challenges that Dallas leaders continue to face. Later on, we'll shift gears to something a little more fun, our Brunch on a Budget segment. You'll get to meet my amazing executive assistant, Ricky Casper, as we explore some delicious and affordable dining options in Lakewood. Thanks so much for being here. Mark Moses, I am so grateful to you for being here. I mean, you're the author of this fantastic book, The Municipal Financial Crisis. One of the first parts where you indicated in your book surrounding the importance of a city's mission, cities that failed to express and define their mission with clarity and practicality often fall prey to systemic scope creep, a term of yours that I am a fan of, leading to widespread inefficiencies. So of course, whenever I went onto the Dallas County website, the Dallas City website, I found the Dallas County mission, deliver exceptional services that promote a thriving community, our vision, improving people's lives, our values, professionalism, customer focus, diversity and inclusion. And the city of Dallas vision statement reads, a diverse, vibrant, progressive and engaged workforce. Would you do me a favor and provide our audience with a high level overview of your insights into the importance of a city mission? A mission statement is, a, is important for any organization. It provides a focus, it helps employees understand what they are actually rallying around. The problem is, and you can have these nice uh, mission statements that, that sound inspirational, but aren't very practical in terms of providing a focus for the organization to rally around. Uh, at the root of it, and I think this is, you know, we can get into this a little bit, but people often blame, oh, you've got incompetent people or lazy people or corruption uh, and, and, and bad systems, but yeah, and that, that exists, but you're never gonna solve any of that with better people or less corruption if your goals are wrong. That's right. and, the, and bad goals fall from poor, vague mission statements that don't give the organization focus. I'd love for you to touch on the different budgeting methods that you wrote about in your book. The traditional budgeting is you take last year's budget mm -hmm. and then you would hold that up against your projected revenues. And if you have a little more in the way of revenues, well, now you can accept proposals for new activities. If you have less, you might push back on the department heads and ask them to go back and cut a little bit. And that's really the balancing budget act, right? Mm -hmm. And so it just means you've got the, or your expenditures in line with the revenues. And then every few years you just issue a capital bond program That's for right. a 1.2, right. 1.3 and you do a big billion. Makeup, or you do a, a sales tax increase <laughs> right. or some other local tax to mm -hmm. make the difference. So that's, that's right. basically the pattern. Uh, and, and one of the things I say is that the problem isn't that taxes are too high, mm -hmm. it's that under the current structure, they're always gonna have to go higher. Mm -hmm. And that's the systemic scope creep and the ambitious drive to expand services that that feeds that mm -hmm. uh, process. So that's the traditional process. Mm -hmm. And you've got a couple other processes that are people champion, like zero-based budgeting, where you say you're gonna start at zero, but it, as a practical matter, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Because you can say you're starting at zero and you're gonna scrutinize everything, but what about all the labor contracts? Well, now you gotta add that, that in because- Yeah, they're multi-year. Absolutely. It's too late to negotiate them. Mm -hmm. So, and labor costs usually account for 70 to, 70 to 80% of a city's budget. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got, so you've got 70 to 80% of your budget spoken for right off the bat, mm -hmm. just with your labor contracts alone. You really just end up operating on the margins in terms of incrementally, we add a program here or there, maybe something falls off but there's no holistic scrutiny, even, even though it's called zero-based, no one really does it in a, in a real deep fashion. Mm -hmm. So budgeting for scope, there, there are two facets of it. You really have to dig in and evaluate every activity in terms of, does this really relate to what a local government organization should be doing and making distinct uh, decisions with respect to, okay, yes or no, and if the answer is no, but because it's, it can't be unraveled or unwound in a short period of time, then you have to look at a longer time frame, maybe a sunset, maybe giving notice to the community that, hey, the city's going to get out of this business 
by year 2028 or 2030 mm -hmm. or whatever makes mm -hmm. sense. So you at least get on that road of unbundling all these things that have accumulated that that local government is not poised to, to do well. And mm -hmm. not, not only not poised to do well, just should not be doing. Like our DART system here in Dallas, and I know I spoke with you about that at lunch, but I just think it was so um, perfectly worded in your book. It says here, scoping requires subjecting all services, programs, and other activities to the following assessment. Does this activity require the local government's legislative and enforcement powers to protect residents, businesses, and their property? That's it. That, that's just so perfect. And then from there, you know, I, I migrate over to 115, how, it, how you write, when a municipality establishes a local monopoly for the provision of water, sewer, ambulance, solid waste, transportation, et cetera, it prevents other potential service providers from participating in the market for that service. Right. Bingo. And then you're trapped because yes. once you've taken it under the purview and commandeered those services, uh -huh. taken them from the private sector That's into right. the local government, now you've basically cut out any creative thinking, competitive uh, market, competitive market That's private right. capital, innovative uh, ideas. You basically cut that off because now you've said, no, this is not in the marketplace anymore. Uh, so send your capital elsewhere, send your innovative thinking elsewhere, mm -hmm. because we're going to hold on to this, quote, service. And it's like making a public utility out of, you know, X commercial service. And, That's right. And public utilities have a reputation, and for good reason, they've earned it, of being very staid, non-innovative. Mm -hmm. They count on the technology to not change. And so when the technology does change, it's a huge wake-up call. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the taxi model got disrupted by Uber with mm -hmm. Uber's technology. Yep. And this whole model that cities were supporting, especially the cities that offered medallions and, and were oh, reaping yes. the benefits. So yes. the cities were reaping the benefits of the medallions and the permits mm -hmm. for the taxi drivers. The consumer was not helped because it controlled the supply of taxi drivers. And then Uber comes along, disrupts the whole industry, and so now the city loses out because it loses its game with the with basically services. feeding off the monopoly that it created. Mm -hmm. And then things open up and to the extent that they leave it open, you have more competition and, the, and a better marketplace for those types of services. So whenever I hear the government wants to go into, like take over a new field, uh, it's, it, it, just make, it just rings in my ears as, oh, let's make a public utility out of X function. And you even have cities uh, across the country now looking at creating their own banks and getting oh into banking. Gosh. And so, uh, yeah, so there's, the point of that is, it's, it's only about a dozen cities are doing it. Oh, San Francisco, I, I can Oakland, understand the point, Seattle. But please ex but, um, elaborate for but everyone. It just, it just shows you how, uh, how, and I spend a little bit of time in the book mm -hmm. on it, but just briefly, but how there truly is no end. It's not like, okay, now it's over, mm -hmm. now they've expanded, now it's satisfied, um, now it'll just you know, keep at this uh, scope of activity. Mm -hmm. No, because every new thing and every new technology winds up to be another opportunity mm -hmm. to get involved in that activity. And then again, it socializes all the local services, mm -hmm. preempts capital investment and in the, uh, the private sector's innovation in name of putting it under a bureaucracy that has enough stress. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially here in Texas where you've got 15 council members or 14 plus the mayor mm -hmm. uh, overseeing very complex activities. Um, there rarely are council members specialists in any one of the activities, let alone uh, you know, have the ability to handle uh, multiple complex activities and you know the private sector gave up on conglomerates and getting involved in multiple disciplines decades ago because mm -hmm. it didn't work you couldn't be a master of of so many different industries under one leadership roof uh, and so they so private sector discovered in the 60s and 70s that 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 fun that that didn't work that way mm -hmm. meanwhile since the 60s and 70s our cities have grown from three or four departments to maybe 10 or 12 departments. Or more even. I mean, today at lunch, Mark Nunnally shared uh, some of the research that he had conducted about the different funds here in Dallas. 
And I was shocked. I mean, I know we have Love Field, our airport, solid, convention and event, right? And then Dallas Water Utilities, development, municipal radio. I wasn't even aware that we had a municipal radio fund and sanitation. And that's not even including DART, which is, I mean, I was complaining to you, telling you we have 6% ridership. Our taxpayers, a city is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on DART. No one's riding it. It's not even safe to ride. And for the life of me, I think, why can't we just put together a plan to eliminate some of these activities or services? If we were to eventually divest from DART and other wasteful activities, would it possibly make Dallas more affordable to live in? I think it certainly would because things like that unleash the private sector. You encourage capital investment, you encourage the creativity of developers and people who really know these businesses, and you, you move it to a different kind of level. And I contrast that with, look at the pattern we're on now. Again, it's not taxes are too high, it's that they're always gonna have to go higher. Uh, DART's always gonna have to charge more uh, to make up for the lack of ridership. And so if you wanna break that pattern, which is just an ongoing and never ending drain, mm -hmm. then yeah, it, it's gonna make Dallas more affordable for everybody. That's when, right. Uh, when you remove that preemption, uh, that cutoff from the market. Mark, having you here has been, like I said, just such a gift. This book just, does leave you feeling hopeful. Like there is a way to get out of where we are today and we can do it. Yep. So thank you. Sure, you're very Thank you for being yeah, here and thank you for your time. Place? Yeah, or what are we're we going to be going to three places, so we have to pick wisely. Well, I <laughs> drove up and I was like, this is so cute. This is adorable. Yeah. I am going to try your red chili lime shrimp, please. She, I'm going to do the hot honey chicken and hummus. <laughs> Ricky Casper, <laughs> she's my executive assistant in all things life. Every part of my life, she helps me remain sane. Okay, y'all, so we have a whole mess of stuff to talk about. This new office. So for this new space, pulling up something that can possibly fit in the new podcast space, my house in Dallas with this renovation, and at the ranch. <laughs> but here's what I told Mark. I said, Monty's get up, and mine too. I want it to be something that's able, and here's the thing, I'm fine sitting in the podcast space, I'm fine having my own backdrop somewhere so that I can be like, hey, coming into you from here, 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 here. I don't care if it's the same table because I'm fine coming in from different locations. But he wants that type of... What about in the corner where you're, where you're in the corner of the master where you're not putting the treadmill anymore or the bike? Because that was originally in the plan. There is a small nook of space to the right of the entry to your closet. I love that. Oh, oh my God, this works. Because I have to... Okay, because here's what, what we've started doing. I've told Monty, I don't want to work in the bed anymore. But then he's like, well, where are you going to work? Because he, whenever I go to the office, he wants me to be in the, in the room with him. So yeah. I'm working and he's working. But I need a desk in the master. Yeah. So this is perfect. Yeah, because there's a little space there by the stained glass She figured windows. it out. <laughs> I was like, we are going to figure this out today. Okay. And then we're not restricted by a thin desk to push against the wall either, because that space was already tight. That's right. Oh my gosh. Oh, doesn't that look so healthy? No, wait, what? Oh yeah, honey, her. Honey, hot, honey hummus? Oh. Oh yeah. That looks amazing. Oh, that looks good. thank you so much. Mm. Yeah, chipotle, not chipotle lime shrimp. I'm waiting for her to tell me that I can have some of hers. <laughs> Ready, set, go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. Ooh. Oh no, you can have some lines oh, so right away. Go. Ahead. I know, I know, but there's broccoli, shrimp, 
cauliflower. Ooh, some chives. Pretty good. Mm. It's not terrible for like a quick food. Quick food. Try that mixture oh my God. with the yogurt. That's delicious. Okay. What do you have? A veggie or a shrimp? And it all. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. That looks really hot. <laughs> I'm like, give me back my hummus. <laughs> we ready to go? Next door. Next stop. Let's go. I'll follow you. I love your little dramatic glasses. <laughs> my what? My dramatic glasses? Yeah, they're like, my cat eyes? Aren't they yes, cat they're dramatic. Glasses? They're drama. Hello. Um, four, please. Mm -hmm. Huh? Sure. I said it's for the kids. I may do huevos rancheros, just a classic. Okay, I was gonna do some, I was gonna do the chilaquiles and the huevos rancheros, but if you get the huevos rancheros, then I'll get the chilaquiles. Okay, and we can split. Yeah. To try some class. Yeah, that's amazing. Classics. Yes. There are good prices though. Right? Yeah. Where? On the menu. Like oh, it's the prices are really, awesome. Yeah. Even the for in my area, area. Even over there. And I live in a lower, a cheaper area. Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> what are we going to say? Lower income area? I don't know. She I lives in... I live in the country. There's a lower cost barrel. of living, right? But those are still really like good prices. Like gun barrel my... area? Yeah. I'd love to see you with a little bit of alcohol. <laughs> me? Yes. You should see me with a lot of bit of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Shannon. <laughs> I'm not from the country. I'm, I grew up in Houston, but um, I moved there about five years ago. Oh, don't old my city. <laughs> What's my hometown? Shannon's a Dallasite. Oh, wait, what's her No, her. You. I'm sorry, I don't know who, it's me. who wound up getting it. Oh, I think. It is pretty, isn't it? Oh, that looks real good. You got chili killers. Chilaquiles, that's right. You're always jealous of my plate. <laughs> <laughs> You're like me when it's I go it. eat. I'm, I'm like, like, can I have some of yours? <laughs> I really want some of those. Go ahead. Well, no, you go first. You go okay. first. All right. I worked out today. I don't want to waste the workout. <laughs> hmm. Oops. Okay, this is real. A little bit of salt. Don't put that on film. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. I'm silly. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just here. Hopefully I'm not ruining. <laughs> That's good. Now, I know what to up. How are yours? Yeah, they look really good. Yours look amazing. Are you really? serious? Is like, it like fried chicken? What is it? It looks fried. Hmm. It's good? Okay. <laughs> Imagine that with like eggs, like in a breakfast taco. Oh my gosh. I don't know, I'm a big breakfast person. Oh, that is mm -hmm. real good. Well, the review for this place will be, we want Ryan's tacos. <laughs> <laughs> no, your tacos, honestly, those tacos, like, are exceptional. Favorite place, shop, shop, or Maddie's. <laughs> um, I, I like, Manny's tacos. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, I'm choosing Chop Shop. I, I love that bowl. Yeah. Look, that, those bowls are so good. But I like the vibe here. Like for a cocktail, and the food was dang good. And that, those cowboy tacos that you got, Ryan, were insane. They're both good. But for today, for a brunch, on a budget. For brunch on a budget, you the like Manny's? The red salsa on the huevos rancheros. Oh, right. For the Look win. at that. Yeah. One and one. <laughs> High five. <laughs>